Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Now this one's going to be all about Azir. Now I want to preface this video with two key points. Number one, Azir is an incredibly complex and micro-intensive champion. If you don't have a natural affinity towards Azir or naturally love Azir, you're going to have a very hard time picking up this champion. And secondly, for me, I actually have a whole second account where I learn all my champions. I literally have a negative win rate on every single one of my champions. This is where... I learned Twisted Fate, Echo, Aurelia, Cassid, and all these champions that were super uncomfortable for me. Now, with Zia, I put 50 games straight on a Zia on this account. I literally had a 40% or even lower at some points, a literally a lower than 40% win rate with a Zia. Now, it took me that many games, even as a Halo player who's already played a Zia in the past, to really understand all the intricacies how to play all the waves, how to roam, play skirmishes, etc. All the little details, it took me that many games. Now, hopefully this will streamline that process for you, so don't feel bad if you are losing a lot with Azir at the start. He is a very re rewarding champion if you can get all the fundamentals down pat. So hopefully this video will really help you. It's going to be a very in-depth, very detailed video. I spoke to one tricks, I spoke to pro players, I played a ridiculous amount of games on this champion. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this video with you guys. So let's dive straight in. Runes literally make or break Azir as a champion. Now, if you don't understand how the runes operate, you're going to have a very hard time adapting your gameplay given each rune page changes how you play the early game, the mid game, and late game. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover all the differing rune pages so you understand when to take each one, why you take, it, take each one, and how you need to optimize your gameplay. Now what we're going to do, we're going to start with the Halo Blades Precision Tree Secondary. Um, this is my personal favorite tree. I think it's the most flexible, most consistent rune page. Now, Halo Blades synergizes incredibly well with Azir, with, um, obviously with Azir's short trades, with Q and auto attacks. It's really, really good. Now, the benefit of Halo Blades over runes like Lethal Tempo is that the cooldown is shorter, um, so it's really, really good for getting that sustained poke down on the enemy. But more importantly, the best thing about this is that it allows you to opt into the Domination Tree. Now, the Domination Tree is incredibly good on Azir for two reasons. Taste of Blood allows you to take aggressive trades in lane and, and stay, you know, quite relatively healthy. But more importantly, Ravenous Hunter. Ravenous Hunter scales incredibly well with Azir. It allows you to heal a ridiculous amount in those mid to late game teamfights. So it's just a really, really solid rune for Azir. Now, the Precision Tree. Precision Tree is, again, another favorable tree to go in, uh, go opt into, because of Legend Alacrity. Legend Alacrity works so well with Azir because of obviously granting you attack speed, and it's, it feels super, super nice. But more importantly as well, we got Presence of Mind. Now, Presence of Mind compensates for the lack of mana that you would get from uh, Mana Flow Band. So basically, it's a bit of a trade-off there, and we'll get into that more in the future. And then you just round that off with... Um, with the attack speed, adaptive force, and either MR or armor. Now, the main trade-off, if you take this rune page, is that it doesn't really scale as well as Conqueror or Lethal Tempo, um, because it has a short cooldown and it kind of wears off really, really quickly. But, again, it has a stronger early laning phase, which I find to be the most useful on Azir. Now, second, here we have Lethal Tempo with Sorcery Secondary. Now, this is another good page. Now, Okay, the premise of this page is all about wave clear. Now, Lethal Tempo, it is a bit of a much better scaling rune than the Halo Blades, but the main reason you would take this page, in my opinion, is if you're playing mainly for wave. Now, Lethal Tempo is better for wave clear because once you uh, Q the enemy and proc Lethal Tempo once on a champion, um, the attack speed actually lasts a lot longer than ha uh, Halo Blades, which allows you to um, use that attack speed to hard shove the wave. So, Lethal Tempo is a very good rune for matchups when you're versing things like Nocturne mid, um, even Rumble mid, but you could, can also op uh, opt in for Conqueror, but we'll get to that in a second. But uh, even a lot of those mages like Zerith and Victor, where you just really want to be hard shoving. Um, the benefit of this page and why I think it synergizes very well with Sorcery Secondary is because, again, if you want to be mainly playing for Wave Clear, you want to be procking your Lethal Tempo with your man timing it with your Mana Flow Band so you don't go Oom all the time, and just spamming the Wave. Um, this one, again, does have less lane uh, strength in the sense of that it's hard harder to poke your opponent, but... And you don't get the healing sustain with um, Domination Tree, but um, it is probably a lot better scaling-wise in terms of just raw damage and uh, better for wave clear. Now, the next one here is the Conqueror page. Now, this one is very good, obviously, for very obvious reasons against heavy frontline when you, you don't really need 
to punish them in the early game. You just basically want to scale into those mid to late game team fights where you're just going to be slowly chunking down the enemy. It's really good into laners like Rumble where they're going to be taking a lot of uh, auto attacks from you. You know, mid lane uh, tanks like Set mid, Mordekaiser mid, etc. Um, this is more of a greedy page, and you've noticed here that I've actually opted in for cut down. This is again versus a lot of those heavy frontline champions. You can also do this one against Galio mid, things like that. Again, it's just important to know. I personally am not a fan of this page as much because I feel like. Azir scales already so well that I would rather opt in for the earlier wave clear with either Lethal Tempo or Halo Blades. But, you know, this one is just good against those front, front line. And then you've also got the Arcane Comet. Um, this is good against... This is a very different type of Azir. Um, this is for Poke Azir in an early laning phase. It can work against some of those um, matchups like Zareth and Victor and things like that. But again, I'd never take this rune page... Um, the reason being is I just think Halo Blades is way better, and obviously you're not you're not um, going into the Precision Tree, which I think is really really bad. And more importantly, it doesn't scale well at all compared to that of um, the other tree. So I really don't recommend this one going too much. So they're the main strengths and weaknesses, and the main room pages. Obviously, if we go back here, uh, we can actually you can go Conqueror with secondary sorcery if you want more mana you can go lethal tempo with domination secondary but again these are the ones that make the most sense for me all right so experiment with all of them see what works best for you personally again i like the halo blaze page but it is really un important to test them all see what feels best for you and um because there's the actually interesting because it was an azir one trick i spoke to he really likes lethal tempo and conqueror then there was a pro player a Ch the best uh chinese pro player likes halo blades he takes it in lpl and again another os azir player that i spoke to likes halo blades as well again it's just really just preference now let's talk about summoners now teleport is an extremely valuable spell for azir now the way i like to view it is this if you're in an even skill matchup where you're versing opponents that you would say you're basically even skill with, that Azir, um, Azir would really benefit from taking Teleport. Because Teleport means you're not going to be able to get any solo kills, you just want to be farming up, not really giving too much pressure, just synergizes really well with Azir. But if you're in a, you know, maybe you're smurfing, maybe you're in a lower elo bracket, you're just dominating opponents, Ignite is really, really good, especially if you're opting in for that Halo Blades page, because you do actually have a lot of kill threat at level 6, and even at those early levels um, with Halo Blades, Ignite is really, really nice. And then obviously you can take Exhaust into some Assassins like Fizz and Kiana, and then Cleanse into things like, you know, Twisted Fate, Galio, etc. So nothing too special here, but it is important to note that um, Ignite and TP is preference, but I find that TP is better if it's even skilled, Ignite's better if it's like a, you're just going to stomp people. Next, builds. Now, this is very important to understand. I get a lot of questions about builds, so let's actually just, let's get it all over and done with in one hit. Now, double Dorans. Now, double Dorans I find to be so nice on Azir for that extra durability because... Again, it complements his early mana usage. It complements him wanting to take heavier trades in the early game. It gives him that durability. And specifically because you're not building any HP or at all or any defensive on your first item, given that you're building Nash's Tooth, um, it works really, really well and gets you through to your you know second or third item. So double Dorans, I really, really love. Now, um, again, obviously, we're gonna, we'll talk about the first row here. Now, this is a standard build path where you're the only AP on the team. Orb when just sitting on orb after your Nashes is very efficient if you're the only AP on your team. If there's more AP, if they're stacking MR, things like that, then this is a bad buy. Um, then I would actually go into this second one where you're going into Leandri secondary into finishing your items. Something to note here, sometimes if you're very far ahead, you can actually skip this completely and go straight into Death Cap, into like Zonia's or Void Stuff, whatever. Um, but again, this does feel really nice for durability purposes. Um, and it does give you an insane amount of early damage if no one gets any uh, MR. So this is really, really nice. Now, if you're versing a lot of heavy, more frontline, you're going to be taking more sustained fights, then the Andrew's really, really nice. Otherwise, again, you can completely skip this and go straight into your Rabadons. Um, and again, this third row here is if you're versing a lot of things with a lot of threat, maybe you're versing things like a Syndra, maybe you're versing just overall things with a lot of threat like Elise and Evelyn, etc., then you can actually go straight from Nash's into a Banshee's or Zonia's. Don't go both of them, either one of them. And then finishing it off again with Rabadon's, Leandre's, Void Staff, etc. And again, for boots, most of the time you want to be going Sorcery boots because... 
um, that early magic pen can actually... With this, in combination with orb, gives you, like, true damage. It's, like, ridiculous. It's an insane amount of damage. You can go attack speed if you're versing a lot of tanks. Um, it can be really, really helpful. I don't personally don't like it. And mercs if you're versing a lot of CC. Now, I really don't like going defensive boots on Azir because... I found that if you're in range to get CC'd, or if you're ever in range to just get CC'd or die like that, then you're probably dead anyway. Zia needs to keep people at range, and he has self-peel with his R. I don't really feel like it's super necessary, and especially if you're already building items like Banshees or Zonyas, Merc Trades just feels useless. The Magic Pen and the Attack Speed feel a lot better. Now, um, so again, recapping here quickly, only go Orb if you're the only AP. Um, Leandri is the most consistent build if you're versing a lot of bruises and things like that. If you're versing full squishies, but they, again, they're getting MR, just go straight from Nashes into things like um, Rabadons or Zonyas or whatever like that. So you don't need to always grow this. And Leandri's is overall better than Morello's because, again, you're taking longer extended fights. Morello's is only good for burst. Okay, or if you need it for healing. So that's the main things about item builds. If you have any more questions about builds, just free, free, feel free to hit me up in the comment section. Now, talking about matchups. Now, this is um, a matchup tier list through the lens of high elo, high elo games. It will change a little bit if you're in lower elo, but a few things I want to highlight here. Cassadin is extremely annoying to verse. I would actually put him in the hard category in lower elos. Um, but in high elos, you can punish Cassadin, and junglers can actually punish Cassadin, so I put him in not favorable. But a few things I want to highlight. Diana is incredibly annoying to verse because he can just constantly engage on you. He's really hard to tether, um, and he just uh, actually jump past your soldiers and just destroy you. So this champion, Echo is really annoying, Nocturne's really... All these champions are very, very hard to verse. You really want to avoid versing these champions at all costs. Sometimes what I actually like to do if I'm playing Azir is actually tell someone to ban Kassadin or wait for someone to ban Kassadin, then I ban Diana because I really don't like, like versing them. Um, these ones, these other ones down here like Zoe uh, uh, like and Rumble are much higher elo picks. In lower elo, you, Azir will actually win these matchups, but it's just in higher elo because higher elo players can actually use their pressure. Um, but you can see there's a lot of skill matchups here, guys. Um, Azir is one of those champions with a lot of um, skill matchups. But more importantly, he actually has a lot of favorable matchups because Azir is a very strong laning champion. So use this tier list as a bit of a guideline. If you have any questions about matchups, just let me know. One thing to note, guys, is that Azir pumps Twisted Fate. This is what I actually realized the hard way. Azir is very good into Twisted Fate. I actually... I didn't realize this as being a Twisted Fate player. Maybe I didn't verse good enough Azir's, but I actually think Azir destroys Twisted Fate, so uh, it's very, very annoying to verse. All right, now let's quickly talk about the four types of early lanes. Now we'll get into more of these details in a more practical sense as we get into the examples, but overall these are the four things. Each matchup will kind of come down into one of these categories, okay? And your job as you learn Azir is to know which matchup fits into each category. Now, this is the most common one. This first one is the most common one. Um, this is where you want to be basically hard pushing. Um, and it'll, again, it'll make a lot more sense in the future. But hard pushing on Azir is extremely uh, beneficial because what it actually does, especially when you're versing champions with high cooldowns, like a Nivea, Xerath, Victor, and Lux, is that it forces them to use their abilities on the wave and actually prevents them from poking you. And I'll literally show an example where I verse a Xerath in this VOD. In this video, and then we've got the second one here, which is slow push and poke. You can do this against champions like Fizz, Kiana, Kassadin, pretty self-explanatory. You do this on a lot of mages versus assassins. Then you've also got the get pushed in. Now, this is when you get hard counted. You're versing, like, again, a Diana with a Shaco jungle. You're versing a Lucian with an Elise jungle. Very annoying, high threat level 2, level 3 champions that you just can't... You can't do anything. You just got to accept that you're just going to get destroyed. You got to minimize the whole entire early game. You just got to get pushed in. They're really, really annoying to deal with. And then lastly, this is actually another really common one. I would say these two are the most common, hard push and then contest 1v1. These are versus these very mid-range champions, like Zoe, LeBlanc, and Cassiopeia, where you're just going to be heavy trading a lot, you're just going to be playing for the wave, but more importantly, you can't just play for the wave because then they will just attack you, so you just got to trade onto them, and then hopefully, and after you've taken that trade, then push, push, push. You can't just all 
hard push like you can versus Nivea, Zereth, Victor, and Lux, because these champions like LeBlanc, Zoe, and Cassio can constantly um, poke you because they have lower cooldowns. So they're basically the four ways, and we'll get into the details in a second, but just good to, to get, you, get, you, get the creative juices flowing, get you guys thinking. I just want to quickly talk about one big tip, guys. Now, this is going to be an overarching theme that I have throughout my whole video, and it's this. Azir's offense is Azir's defense. Now, what I mean by this is Azir is a champion that thrives when he is pushing. Now, it's for two reasons. One, he obviously, one of his biggest strengths is his wave clear. Now, again, if Azir is always pushing, then the enemy has to use abilities on the wave, which again is going to free Azir from getting poked, which allows him to scale into mid game. But more importantly, it frees him up to use his abilities to actually poke. And especially if you're taking abilities like uh, runes like uh, Hail of Blades. Um, if you have that those resources with your Q in the room to be able to Q the enemy, you are going to have so much threat on the enemy. So it's a really, really important concept to understand as an Azir player. It will make a lot more sense as I give it a little context with my VODs, but it's just something, again, I want you to think about, and it's going to be a theme that I constantly push. Now, what's the most important thing, guys, if you want to do this strategy? Is that map awareness and jungle tracking is so important. If you don't know how to jungle track on Azir, you don't know how, you don't have good map awareness, you don't know how to use your wards, Azir is not a good champion for you because this means you're always going to get pushed in because you're too scared to push and it means that you're just going to get poked under tower, you're not going to be able to scale, the enemy's just going to be able to roam for free, it's going to be a very, very bad time. So you need to have good map awareness, you need to push your limits with jungle tracking, you need to be an alpha, essentially. You have to be an alpha male when playing Azir, otherwise it's going to be very hard for you to actually win games with a Z in solo queue. So at this point, you may be a little confused, saying things like, Curtis, why are you telling me to play Azir like an aggressive alpha male? Why would I do that? Like, isn't Azir a safe scaling champion? This doesn't make sense to me. Now, this is a massive misconception about Azir. Now, let, let me clarify this point. If you play Azir like a safe scaling champion, you won't climb ELO. You, you will find it very hard to, to reliably win games in solo queue. And as you guys know, if you played any mid-major solo queue, the assassins or high pressure champions will push you in, they will roam, they'll create chaos, you won't get time to scale, and you're just going to be basically a sack of shit. You're going to be completely useless. Now, you may ask then, well, why is he played then in competitive? Now, in competitive, it's completely different because, again, people will listen to your calls, sidelanders won't get caught out, but more importantly, Azir is drafted with frontline and multiple threats on the team. Now, think about how Azir wants to fight. Azir wants a structured front-to-back fight where he's got his frontline in front of him where he can free DPS. If he can't auto-attack, then he's not going to be able to get that damage off. Whereas in solo queue, guys... It's very rare that you're going to get structured fights around objective. It's very rare that you're going to have frontline in your team composition where they're actually going to peel for you. So in solo queue, you have to be very self-sufficient and you have to adapt. You can't play Azir like a bitch. You can't play Azir like a safe scaling mage. Even though he is a safe scaling mage, you have to play him aggressive. You have to play him fast. And again, it will make a lot more sense, but this is the only way to reliably climb with Azir in solo queue. And after watching a lot of Azir players in high elo, how they do it, again, they don't play safe. They roam. They go to side lane plays. They, they are creative with their ultimate. They do things. They don't just sit lane, sit in mid lane, and farm, farm, farm. You cannot do that on Azir. And because even if you do, you're not going to be able to carry because the side lanes are going to be so fed. You're not going to get your own self peel. Um, you're going to have to build defensive, which is going to lower your damage anyway. There's all these reasons as to why Azir doesn't scale as well as you think he does. Now what we're going to do, let's dive straight into some of the VODs, guys. Alright, guys, so let's dive into our first VOD of the day here. Now, this is one of probably three or four VODs I'm actually going to go over. This is going to be a very in-depth video. This first one's going to be Azir versus Orianna. Now, this is a very bread and butter matchup. I actually opted in for Teleport. Orianna opted in for Teleport because I don't think I could solo kill, so I didn't take Ignite. And especially since I didn't have a pressure jungler, I didn't feel comfortable taking Ignite. Maybe if I had something like a Lee Sin, a Lee's Rek'Sai Jarvan, maybe I would have opted in for Ignite. But I went for Halo Blades with uh, Precision Tree Secondary, and I'm actually versing a Lee Sin. Now, again, we're going to go over multiple VODs here. I just think this is a really good one to start with. Now, what's the first thing we know about this matchup? Well, Orianna isn't exactly a very high cooldown champion. She can constantly poke. But again, my goal is to always push this Orianna in so she can't use poke on me. And I'm not going to be afraid to contest her. But my first goal in lane in any Azir matchup 
basically, unless the unless you're playing like versus Diana and things like that, is to get level two first. And I want to talk about how you can reliably achieve this. <clears throat> so. First thing we need to talk about, we're going to go very in detail here, is the soldier placement. Soldier placement, I can't stress this, this enough, how important it is to have intention with your soldier placement. Now, soldiers, the way they work is if you position them appropriately on one side of the minions, you can actually attack all three. Now, you're not going to have this luxury where you're going to be able to actually use your W on the, the back three creeps. If you can, if this person plays defensive for some reason... Um, or they're playing like a bitch, or maybe you're just in a better, higher range matchup, it is always better to use your um, your soldier on the, the caster creeps. Now, look at this. When I use it, like here, I, I Q, I mean, sorry, I W, and when I auto-attack, look at that. When I auto, it's not just hitting one of them, it's actually damaging all three. Now, this is a huge, um, really nice little tip you can actually do to ensure that you basically outwave clear any other champion. Then you may ask them, why aren't you going to, why don't you use your W on the melee creeps? Can't you do the exact same thing? What I've realized is that if you use your W on the melee creeps, they go haywire. One of these melees will just start running out at you. A lot of the time, they'll actually split up after one of them dies. Whereas if one of this dies, these will actually stay here. They won't move too much. Whereas these melees will go crazy. So it's a lot harder to AOE the melee creep. So it isn't a, a, a small detail, but it is very important. If you're versing someone who's really trying to hard press you, what you can actually do is use two of them, um, literally two of them instantly, and actually hard smash out these range creeps. But another potential position of creep is actually a W in the middle here. And the benefit of that is that you can actually um, kill both of them. You can maybe kill the melees, and if it stays up long enough, you can actually start hitting the range creeps as well. Whereas in the early game, in the very first W, I don't really like doing that. I like to just all in on the on the cast creeps. This is something that Caps actually does uh, very well on Azir. When a Caps plays Azir, he actually does this. Now, the other benefit of, of using your W aggressively on the caster creeps is that a lot of the time, this guy's not going to know how to... He's going to play very defensively and start panicking. He's like, I don't want to get in range of this of this W. What if he auto-attacks me? In reality, it doesn't do much damage at all, and Oriana shouldn't be scared, but a lot of the time, this actually sometimes zones the opponent and prevents them from walking up. What you can actually do is actually place one here and then another one like here to go this way. And so they're both AOEing the range creeps. And then this guy actually feels so scared to walk up. And it is a bit of a zoning tool. Prevents them from hitting the wave, but also helps you wave clear. So it is a nice little detail there. But again, I'm just auto-attacking the creeps. I'm not focusing on Oriana at all for now. I just really want to get this wave in. Yes, I might miss one or two CS. Obviously, you can practice um, you know, getting all the CS, which is very important. But my main objective here is just to get this wave in. Already, Orianna's not respecting, so I just auto-attack, bang, 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 with my Halo Blades. Nice. Now, I don't want to use, I don't, really don't want to use another W here. Now, if I use a W near the tower here, soldier here, the way the soldiers work is that obviously, um, they die faster. So if you're in range of the tower, the, the soldier actually won't last as long. And usually I believe there's like a question mark or an exclamation mark above the soldier, which means it's in tower range, which means it actually um, will die faster. So generally what I try to do is not use my W under tower because it's going to be super unreliable to get any significant poke. Two reasons. One, my Halo Blades is actually down. Two, um... I don't have my Q, so I can't reposition it, so you can just walk out of it. And three, um, it's going to it's gonna actually die super, super fast, which means um, I'm not going to be able to use it for auto-attacking the creep. So there's a lot of reasons why I don't really want to be using Q early game, level one, under the tower. So what I actually do is to continue to play for the wave, auto-attack the wave. Again, Q, Q, uh, WWW, try and get this level two. Again, remembering that level two is the first creep off the second wave. As soon as I get level 2, notice how I'm already posturing up aggressively. Bang! Q, auto attack, bang with my Halo Blades. Look at that. Beautiful trade. Now, Orianna is now 3 quarters HP, basically, just off um, this. And now we know, guys, if you guys watch my jungle tracking video, you can freely do this when you're versing basically 90% of junglers, unless you're versing a level 2 jungler, which you need to be a little bit more careful. But as we know from my jungle tracking video, you're not really going to get ganked pre-2 minutes 30. So generally what I like to do is hard shove, play very aggressive the first two waves, then duck out of vision, get my ward at around 225, 230, around that, um, and then um, continue the onslaught. Now... 
Again, push, push, push. I'm not giving this Oriana. It's, and it's so much harder now for Oriana to position Q onto me because she has to worry about wave clearing. This is the beauty. This is why Azir's offense is Azir's defense. This is seeing it in live. This is live action. Beautiful, beautiful. Look what I do here. Make sure the wave's actually in here. Get a nice little bit of poke off there. I could have missed an auto attack there, but it is what it is. It's actually funny about the is what it is. I always get memed about that. I need to stop saying it. Now I get my ward at 230. Beautiful. Now I have a, a very aggressive side to lean onto. This is going to help me play aggressive. It's going to help me track the jungler, knowing that most likely Lee Sin is doing... He can do um, either red Krugs into bot side, in which, again, I have a heavy side to lean onto. Or, again, given that he's a machete jungler, uh, blue Gromp into, like, red into river or something like that, you know, so... I didn't actually catch where he started this game. So notice how on this third wave, I don't hard push. And the reason you don't hard push the third wave is because I know it's a cannon wave. I'm not going to be able to reliably push it in. And more importantly, um, this is when the jungler is going to be looking to start to pressure and looking to start to do something in the... Um, in the river, and I'm not going to really feel comfortable poking this guy under tower. So what I actually like to do is let it come out a little bit, then start to build a nice little build one or two ways, like a bit of a slow push, then push it in. But I still don't want to let Oriana get push on me. I just, I, I still want to create a minion advantage, and the reason is I want to be there first for the scuttle fight, talking about the 315 scuttle fight. So this is why I don't really want to let Oriana push. I basically just want to keep it in the middle with a slight minion advantage. And notice I'm just leaning onto the top side because that's where my vision is. And I'm not, I'm not wasting too much of my mana. Now, this is actually a massive, massive thing on Azir that I, I had so many painful experiences with this. Because Azir feels so strong early game with Halo Blades and Q, uh, your W and Q, it actually brings about a tendency just to spam Q. You'll be spamming Q so much, you won't even realize that you're going Oom. Um, and especially since I don't go into Mana Flow Secondary, you go Oom um very, very quickly. Then you're up the shit, you're up shit creek, then you're uh, you're in a very bad spot. So, a lot of the time, I, I play quite aggressively, levels 1 and 2. Level 3, I start to tone it down a little bit. Given that I've got Dorans, I've got a little bit of mana regen, I tone it down a little bit. You know, you know, bring on... I continue to use my soldiers, but I don't queue as much. Now, now we see Lee Sin on the, on the minimap here. Beautiful. No, no, we know where Lee Sin is, because I, I feel I'm playing quite safe. And again, if I was hard pushing up here then I would be either forced to E, or it just wouldn't be a good time. So, I'm just chilling. Slowly, again, continuing my, my, my brief little onslaught. Now, that's actually a kind of a bad Q. Now, I want to talk about Q usage. Apart from, obviously, you know, <sighs> rationing out your mana, another good principle for Q is you very rarely, actually never, I'm going to say go out and say never, never use Q if you can't also get an or at least one auto attack. If you use Q and don't get an auto attack, it's basically, it's the most mana inefficient um, use of damage ever. Very, very poor use of mana. So you very rarely want to just use Q. You always want to ensure that you're always going to order at least once or twice on the back end. So notice I get one Q there. Oriana could have easily kept walking out, but she walked back in. Um, but that was a very inefficient Q. And I get like maybe one tiny auto attack off with a shield. This is a very poor usage of mana. You want to be always looking at that. So Oriana's trying to push me out. Um, and then we actually see, if we go back here. So what actually I thought here, because Oriana was walking aggressively, I actually thought that Leeson was coming from behind me or something. So I was actually quite scared. So I'm actually trying to um, lean a little bit and try and play quite defensively, play for the wave. Then I see Leeson invade my jungler. I want to back him up. So I can't help my jungler here. Unfortunately, um, top had move. He goes quite aggressively here. And there's really not much we can do. And then we kind of just get destroyed here. So uh, I have to just back off. And I have to use my E out. And I just have to teleport back to lane. So this is quite bad for Azir. Now, I find most of my games with Azir is that I want to be... Say, let's just say this was an even state game where my junglers... The, both the junglers traded scuttles. So my Rengar went into top side. Got top scuttle. I was quite free to lean onto top side. Leeson was on bot side. Generally, again, I would use this. I would uh, posture quite aggressively. Build maybe one and a half waves. Start pushing this person in with a nice built wave. Basing when the next wave is a cannon. Basing around 750 gold. It's very similar to Echo in that sense. Getting another Dorans. 
and getting a dagger. That would be a really, really solid buy. So any anything between 750 to 800 gold would be a really nice buy for maybe a pink ward as well. But Dorans and a dagger is quite nice. But given this happened, I could only afford a, a second Dorans. Um, and then not, you know, not much I can do about that. So, and I believe oh, Oriana actually got that kill somehow with the EW. So that was really annoying. So Oriana actually got first blood. So I teleport back to lane, get my second Dorans and a pink ward. And Ring, uh, Oriana end up actually having a, uh, a red buff, which is very annoying. So what I actually do right now is I just focus on farm. I slow it down a little bit. I know that I can't really poke out this Oriana reliably, given that she has red buff. So I slow down the pace of the laning phase. You'll notice how I don't really use Q too much now. I'd kind of just play for the wave. Now, this is a very important thing to understand here. And I actually didn't even understand this for such a long time. I just thought it was a bug. And I'll actually show you a specific example later in detail about how this works. If you have multiple soldiers on the ground and then you use Q, the distance is actually shortened by a little bit. So if I had one soldier here and I use Q, the distance will actually be longer. It will actually be longer. So I can actually throw my Q further. But if the more soldiers you have, three or four, the shorter the, the Q will actually go because it spreads out the soldiers. And each time, each soldier, and because it's spreading it out, it's not going further. If that makes sense. It's something you will need to try and test and practice tool. But here, this is a perfect example. I go for a Q and look how short the range is compared to what it was before. Like that was so short. And that would actually probably be up here. Maybe would have been able to auto attack Ori once or twice with my Q if it was just one soldier. So it is something to a little detail to think about there. So I'm just trying to thin the wave a little bit here. Um, you know, again, which is going to prevent Oriana from poking me as much. But I basically just want to CS farm up a little bit, knowing that I can't really reliably poke out this Oriana. Beautiful. So now use this as an opportunity to get a pink ward. And again, right now, I know that most likely Lee Sin is going to be on bot side, right? Because Lee Sin is going to probably finish his camps on top side, reset, go to his bot side, given that he did a bot to top clear. Now, it is very important to use this information to jungle to jungle track. So this is why I'm putting my pink on bot side, also in combination with my bot lane also getting a kill bot. So playing to my strong side, but more importantly, trying to spot out where Lee Sin's going to be in the future. Beautiful. Now, um, what I actually do here is I just last hit. I'm just chilling because I really want to build a slow push and then force Oriana to teleport in here. Beautiful. Nothing too special going on. And the reason I'm not hard pushing here is because... Um, okay, so what slow pushing actually does really well is slow pushing allows you to poke more under tower with a bigger minion wave. It gives you more time to actually deep ward, which we've seen is really important on Azir. And actually gives you time to roam. And I actually do uh, quite a few roams this game. And, uh, and you'll see it in a second. It's a misconception that Azir can't roam. Which is very, very interesting. Now notice, notice one thing. Look how much mana I used before. Because I have double Dorans, my mana region's actually insane. Now this is a huge benefit of going double Dorans. Look at this. I was on like 200, 230 mana. We fast forward a little bit just by only using Ws on the wave. Just auto attacking. Now I'm nearly up to... You know, 400 mana. Because I got f literally 4 mana regen a second, which is super, super nice. This is the, the main thing I love about Dorans as well. Now, just chilling. Just chilling, leaning to my bot side. Then what I say, I see Lee Sin top side. Look what I do. So you see, I see Lee Sin top side. You get my finish getting my CS. I press tab and I look at his items. And what do we know, guys, from our um, my jungle tracking video? When you see this, 28 CS with hasn't based yet, I know that he hasn't gone to, he hasn't reset, he hasn't gone to his bot side, he's just been clearing camps on the top side, probably counter jungled this Rengar, um, you know, full cleared his top side, maybe got a few, maybe a lane CS, got that top scuttle. After that kill, if he gets it, he's going to be resetting, going back onto his bot side most likely. Or splitting the map knowing that Rengar's taken it. So right now, I know where Lee Sin is for a long time. So I know this is an isolated 1v1. So I know this is very, very good for me right now. I know exactly where he's going to be. And I know 100% Lee Sin's not going to gank anymore. He's going to 100% reset because he has so much gold. So then I see um, Oriana. Her red buff ran out. So look what I do. And I actually want to talk about this trade. Now, this is a bad Q. I actually can't, this is so big. I need to I need to rant about this. This is so big for you guys. And I'm going to save you so many painful experiences. And I'll show you another example. I have a specific clip talking about this. Q 
Q usage is unbelievably important. It is, it is the Bible of a Z, okay? What do we know about Q? Now, Q is a very long cooldown, but what's the main thing about, what's the main, what is the main, I guess, role of the Q ability? It's not damage, it's repositioning your soldiers. So right now, is Ori's trying to do some weird pull wave to freeze or some shit? Like, I don't know what Ori's trying to do right now. I notice her red buff's gone. I know this is an isolated 1v1. So I'm like, you know what? I can actually trade quite aggressively here, right? So, um, what I actually thought in the moment was that Ori was just going to walk around here knowing that she kind of fucked up. And that I was just going to get Q poke here and then force her to walk out here. But, I saw her posture here. What you should actually do is what you should do is you just place Ws here. I walk up, place two Ws here. Now, if she walks through, you know, beautiful. She walks into my auto attack range. And then if she, you know, maybe she starts walking out, I can reposition with my Q to get po poke on the back end. There's no reason for me to use my Q for poke at this range like this. Look at that. She's walking into me anyway. There is no need to Q here. So right now, she wants to go back to lane. If I had Q, you'll see here, if I had Q, I would be able to Q here, Q here on the back end and poke her even more. My Q is completely wasted. Always, when you go into these fights, your main objective should be to, uh, I guess, aggr as aggressive as you can, place your W so you don't need to instantly reposition with Q. View Q as like the oh shit button. W as aggressive, you put your soldiers as aggressively as you can, then use Q to punish as the enemy reposition. Don't, don't start your fights with Q, ever. It's very, very bad. Now, so what would look actually happens here? W and actually Q, which is bad, but what we should have we've established that I should just W and W here. I have two soldiers. I would auto attack, auto attack, auto attack. Then what does E do? Now E is great for trades for two reasons. E gives me the shield, but more importantly, E actually gives you another soldier. E, if you hit a champion with your E, it gives you another soldier. So what actually I actually get another stack of my soldier, which allows me to put a third one. Look at that, I put a third one here, get my extra attack speed, and then auto attack, auto attack, auto attack, and I get a really nice trade. Yes, it cost me a lot of mana, but it is something to think about there. So two main points there, guys. Use E in these aggressive trades when it's an isolated 1v1 for, for good trades because of the shield and getting you another soldier. Never start fights with a Q and always look to reposition Q after they move. Don't start a position with Q. Don't start a fight with Q. Okay. So I'm in a pretty good position right now. Now, um, right now, a few things I need to think about. And this is something that will come with time as a Zia. What do we know? We know that we both don't have teleport. I don't have much mana. I don't have a blue buff. But what's more important, I've got a decent amount of gold, but I'm actually nearing six. Now, 6 is an insanely important power spike for Azir. Azir can basically is one of the best gank setup champions in the game at the moment with his Azir shuffle into, you know, you can shuffle them into your tower, in towards your jungler. Um, you can blow their flash. You can actually flash with them again and push them further. It's, there's so many things you can do. So, a lot of the time, when after I come back from my uh, post first base, I actually like to build a wave or slow push or even just base on a cannon wave, knowing that I want to reset my items for my level 6 power spike and then have enough mana to do a full um, Azir sec shuffle thing. So, that's what I always look, like, look to try to do. So, what I try to do here is... Um, I tried to slow push a little bit here. I'm not hard pushing because I, again, I want to, if I slow push, then I'm not going to be able to miss too much CS. So what I do, I'm just trying to slowly get a minion advantage, taking my time here, taking my time here. I know that I don't have too much mana, so I'm not just spam queuing on this Orianna. I'm kind of saving my mana for my soldiers. And this is where, um, experience with Azir is very important. And thinking ahead is very, very important here. So I know Lee Sin's bot, still an isolated 1v1. I'm trying to chunk out this Orianna so then I can get the wave in and reset. So what do I do? I'm all pushing, pushing, pushing. Now I've built up quite a nice little wave here. And what's the main mistake of Orianna here? Is that she shouldn't be looking to trade onto me. Orianna should just be looking to play for the wave and prevent me from slow pushing. And now this is the benefit of standing outside the wave because then she has to make a choice between poking me or playing for the wave, and because she doesn't know what she's doing, she know what she doesn't know what she's playing for. She probably doesn't understand, don't have any intention with what she's doing. She's gonna dig herself a hole. Now I've I focus the wave, um, and now I'm able to get the wave in with a nice reset. Beautiful. Now this is exactly what you want to be looking for: basing around level six for your second base, and coming back for your level six power spike to set up a gank. Now. Itemization. Obviously, we've spoken about Nash's Tooth, but you may ask, do I go Stinger first? Do I go um, 
Fiendish Codex, how do I know what to go? What I've realized is that Fiendish Codex with a dagger is always better than just um, Stinger. That's that's my personal preference. I just think it's a lot nicer if you can do that. If you can get Fiendish Codex with a dagger, it just feels a lot nicer. So that's what I would recommend. So I go that. Otherwise, if you don't have that amount of gold, then just go Stinger. Now, I come back, I get my Fiendish Codex, and I literally, on my way back, I literally type mid. I literally type my jungler. We can kill mid. I have R. That's what I literally tell my jungler. And I've got a pink ward on bot side. Beautiful, but I still got another pink just in case. Rangar now knows. So he's pinging um, red into mid, knowing that he's very close to level 6. So I'm thinking, oh, this is beautiful. So what I want to actually try to do as I come back into lane here, um, I actually try to get a bit of poke off on Orianna first to just get her a little bit, you know, chunked. So I get that nice little Q poke with the auto attack. Now, I want to wait. I, we were not coordinated here at all. I got my Q poke just to chill. Then my Q's on 7 second cooldown. So, this is, I'm going to talk about a few things here. What I should have done is actually ping the cooldown of my Q because I can't do my Azir sec without my Q. I need to EQ and then either flash R or just R, whatever, if, she, if I think she's not going to flash or she doesn't have flash. Because my Q's down here, um, Rengar actually comes thinking that I'm going to Azir sec, but I don't have my Q. So the, the, the gang just completely fails. Now, another little tip here, guys, that you can actually do, and I found this to be the most successful, so notice how you do. The, I do this this trade. Ideally, what I'll do is I'll actually walk up quite aggressively, just place a W here, and then pretend I'm scared to getting ganked or something. And I would actually start to walk back a little bit. Now the E range is actually very very big. So what you actually do is you W aggressively here, you walk back, make them feel a little bit safe. They're going to walk up. Then I turn around with my EQ, knowing that they're going to be overextended, very close to my W, my 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 soldier that I placed down. That's going to allow me to close the gap, and then I get a free R. The biggest mistake I see from Azir players, and I did this at the start as well, is they make their combo so obvious. They're like, derp, I'm just going to put a W here, and then they, they expect them not to move, and then they W, E. It's so obvious that you can do Azir sec. Do the shimmy, walk back, make them come in a little bit, then look for the combo. You de you, like That's what I was trying to do here. Notice how I'm walking back like this. Notice how, how defensive I'm walking, but again, uh, Rengo just went way too early here. That would have worked, honestly, but we fucked that one up pretty bad. <laughs> okay. So now, now I know that I've built a nice little wave here where we've, we've forced um, Oriana to back out from the um, from this engagement. Now, what does this mean? If when you build waves on Azir, I have so many options. I can't roam top. Rally is already chunked out. Um, I have a pink on bot side, so I, and my bot side's winning, so I know that they're taking pretty good trades. But more importantly, um, I don't really feel comfortable poking this guy. I don't think that's the way to go in solo queue. Yes, you can poke under tower if there's nothing else to do, but if you have a winning side, always play to roam. It's a it's a fallacy. It's a misconception that you shouldn't roam on Azir. So I build this wave. Beautiful. I was actually going to look for a dive on this guy, but Rengar's um, bot side. So what I realized, like, you know, screw it. I'm just going to go bot and then help bot out. So what I do, I should have been painting my camera a lot more here, to be honest with you. That's a... So I pan bot, got a nice built wave. I actually pan my camera onto my next wave to confirm how long I got, because I actually see that this is a cannon. So I pan my camera to see that's a cannon wave. So I know in my mind I have a lot of time. So, beautiful. We're going for this skirmish. I've backed up. I've got priority. Nice. Go for an EQ. Nice. Bang, bang. Auto attack. Chase, chase, chase. We get a nice kill here. Turn onto the Lulu. Now... I want to talk about how I engage this fight. So notice how I don't just instantly start my Q. I don't just WQ here. That's a rookie mistake. Never just WQ this guy, like we said before. What you do is you walk up, close the angle. You want to engage your fight with your W first. Make them make them walk into your W range. Then reposition with Q. So what do I do? I put my, my soldier here, knowing that she's walking into it. This will allow me to get more auto attacks. It's, it's going to allow me to then QE out. So if I started this fight with Q, it would be doomed. Look at this. So I W, I get Polymorph, so I actually can't auto-attack. Then I EQ like that. So it actually allows me to reposition and get out of the tower range as well. Dodge the ult. or dodge the Q, sorry. Now, I actually thought we we're going to disengage, but then Z Varus actually walks through. So I'm like, oh, shit. All right, I'll back you up. And it ends up being a pretty um, somewhat sloppy dive, but it ends up working. Now, um, again, this is, this is so big, man, this whole thing. This this style of Azir that I'm talking about right now, a very aggressive mindset. My mindset is very aggressive. This this took me so long to figure out because I was always under the misconception that no, Azir just wants to poke, utilize his attack speed on the tower, poke, 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 and get tower plates and shit. Like, yes, you can do that, and you do, you do that once you get Nashes and stuff, but Azir, and, and yes, this is a little bit contradictory to Azir's nature in the sense that 
he doesn't want as much chaos. But what I've realized, Azir can adapt. Azir can play this very chaotic, skirmish-heavy um, style because he has mobility with his E, really good gank startup and self-peel with R. Um, it's a misconception that you need to play like a defensive, like a Nivea or something. You don't need to play like that. That's old school way of playing Azir. Um, and this whole thing, the way I'm playing is just, I never would have thought this is the way you should play Azir. And um, yeah, this was actually mind boggling. So this actually took me so many games to actually figure out. Like Curtis, what am I doing? Why don't I just do it? And this is what I recommend guys. You will int. I'm telling you, you will int doing this the way. And this is the only way to reliably climb with Azir in my opinion. You can't climb the other way. Now, you will int going to these skirmishes. You will figure out you'll have painful experiences. Oh my god, I just put myself in a bad position. Oh, I have no mana. Or I, I misplaced my R. I didn't do the combo, the shuffle right. Whatever. You're going to have so many painful experiences. But you have to do it. Straight up. Like, there's no excuse. You have to do it. This is how you push limits and how you learn with Azir. Now, another beautiful, massive strength of Azir is because I'm going presence of mind, any kill or assist increases my mana pool insanely like by an insane amount so presence of mind in these skirmishes is so 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 good okay so um this is why as well going for these skirmishes is really important on azir because if you don't get any kills or no assists your mana pool is going to be up shit creek you're going to be in a bad spot so um i love getting early assists and early kills on azir it's so important anyway Get this done, reset, I work towards my Nashes, I can't really afford it, so I just get my Stinger and, and Tier 1 Boots, and I come back mid. Beautiful, I know the enemy jungle is dead. Now, I know this Orianna doesn't have Flash, and I know that I have Ultimate in 40 seconds, so that's the main thing I'm thinking about right now. Do I have Vision? Um, I need to get my Vision down, I've got two Trinkets, do I have a Pink Ward on one side of the river? I want to poke her whenever I can, knowing that Lee Sin's actually dead and coming out of base at the moment. I want to make sure that I'm setting up a kill on this Orianna as soon as I can. So I get this wave in, knowing that I really want to use my Vision first, because it's always, it's always Vision first, then set up kills. You don't set up kills, then get Vision. You always get your Vision down. So what I do, use the Scry's Bloom, um, put a nice little ward down here as well. Get some nice poke off. And now I know my ult's in 10 seconds. Look at this. Get this ward. I ping my ult. Knowing that Azir's in the river here. I know I can go for a kill. Look at that. I walk backwards. Look at this. Look at my character. So I, I, got, I walk up. Use an aggressive W. Very deep in the lane. I walk back. Then I go bang. Instantly. She's not even expecting it. Force her down into the river like this. Because she has no escape. Straight into my jungler. So this is good for so many reasons. This is good because I know I have control in the vision. I know my jungler's in the area. I know she doesn't have flash. If I push her down into that river, it's really hard for her to escape. To escape here. So, um, bang. Look at that. And if she ran upwards, I would be able to chase her and kill her anyway. So either way, it's a really good play. So we're able to get that nice little kill there. Helps my mana pool again with presence of mind. Now I can push, push, push. So I push, push, push. Nothing too special here. Now, another little tip here. Um, I end up TPing to this fight. This is against side lane awareness. This was a little bit sketchy. I, look at this. So I go to this fight. I don't know about this decision. This is something I, I recommend you doing, but review doing your own reviews. He goes invisible, so I'm not able to get that auto attack. So I end up shields, and oh, it's just so annoying. I end up trading kills. It's not worth it. Now, in review, I would look at this. I'll be like, okay, what are the trade-offs of this play? I get two plates here. And get to base, free base with my Nashes. Because Orianna's dead for 10 seconds, but she does have teleport. Or, I teleport to this play, push my limits, and actually help them get a double kill potentially. Um, and then we get bot tower. I wouldn't have known if this didn't work, um, if I didn't go for it. I wouldn't have tested my limits. I thought this, you know, I thought this was a good play. Given that a, a vein was so low and they were pretty overextended, I knew they didn't really have sums. So, um, you know, not really much I could have done here. So, I would recommend you go for these sorts of plays and learn from them after. That's how you own... This is the main way you're going to improve with this year. So, I go back, get my Nashes, come out of base. Now, I tell my team I want Rift. Okay, so given Azir, I have so much control in the lane, and a lot of the time when you're ahead on Azir, you're gonna have a lot of you're gonna have a lot of river control, you're gonna have a lot of room to poke, you're gonna get that deep vision, you're gonna be in a really good spot. So what does that mean? If you want to push the pace of the game, it's really important that you call for rifts because rifts um, are good for two reasons. Because once you break that mid tower, um, I have so much room to roam, which again Azir can do with his ultimate very very well. But more importantly, I can put that my passive on that mid tower and get ridiculous amount of pressure on the map, like exert a ridiculous amount of pressure. 
So again here, what do I see? I see Orianna and River. I know that she doesn't have Flash, and I know that I have Ultimate. Whenever I see Orianna out of position, and I know my jungler's in the area, I want to set up a kill. I force Orianna this way. I go for a nice little sweep into an Ultimate, and then bang into another kill. Beautiful. So I go back mid. Now, another little tip here, guys. When you're going for towers like this, put your, your soldiers behind you like this. Spam your soldiers. This is going to allow you to get your um, passive proc with for the extra attack speed. But more importantly, if the jungler comes, then you have somewhere to just instantly E out. So it's a really good defense mechanism. It allows you to push your limits without being too scared. So like that. I would get that extra attack speed, get some poke down, play for the wave. Push, 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 knowing that Orianna is coming out of base, and I want to get as many plates as possible. Ideally, I want to get all three, so then we rift, then we're going to be able to get that tower easily. So again, I'm always using my soldiers behind me. So if um, uh, so if the, jung the jungler or the mid laner comes, I can just E out really, really easily, basically. Or again, use the Ws to poke. Nice. So now, one thing to note, guys, when you have Nashes, you get towers incredibly fast. So you need to take that into account when going for roam plays and think, well, I could get maybe two or three plates on my own or go for this play. It's not like you're playing Orianna where you get towers really, really slow. You actually get towers incredibly fast. So it is something to think about there as well. So bot's winning really hard. I don't really need to do anything there. So I thought, you know what, let's just stay mid. So I put a soldier behind me. Again, just constantly eing out whenever Orianna looks to, to Q me. There's nothing she can do. Now, uh, this VOD is super... Imp I think this VOD is a really good example, uh, as you see this game actually pan out, of how to push your lead. And you'll see in a second, as this game progresses, how I actually turn a game where, you know, we're winning, but, you know, it's not a complete stomp. It's, like, pretty good. But, again, it's solo queue. You really want to know how to push out leads. Again, it, notice how I've got my side lanes ahead. I've played for these roam plays. Now I want to play for towers. I want to play for objectives. And you'll see... Um, I'm constantly pushing my limits, but with my I'm um, with my soldiers, constantly getting as much um, tower poke off as possible. End up soloing my blue, beautiful. Go back mid, because I really want this mid tower. Once I get this mid tower, I can generate a lot of threat. Now, macro. Let's talk about macro for a second. When your bot laner gets this tower, a lot of the time they're going to want to match two v two mid. Now. Something to think about with Azir, guys, is that Azir shreds AD carries. Azir is very good into low-range AD carries, like Vayne, things like Draven, anything with low range, which a lot of a lot of um, AD carries are low range. Now, the reason being, obviously, is that they're incredibly squishy. I'm going to be building Nashes, maybe even Sorks. So I'm going to be doing true damage to them since they don't build resistances. Um, and obviously, they're going to find it really hard to get into deal with my wave clear and get into my range. Now. What does this actually do? That what what are the trade offs? If I match mid, then my AD carry and support get to be in a side lane, and we basically get two lanes of pressure. If I am behind for some reason, then you should always go on the side lane and let that your AD carry and support match because then I'm going to be giving too much pressure in mid lane. If you can pressure them one v two mid, then you should always do that because Azir ideally wants to stay mid for the longest period of time because again he has more options. He has a shorter lane, so he can't get chased down. He can roam to sides quite easily. Um, and again, once he gets this mid tower like this, you can place your your turret and you can exert a ridiculous amount of pressure and actually do an extended siege. Now I want to talk a little bit actually about this passive usage. Now, passive, this tower passive is actually an incredibly strong ability. Um, I only re the way I recommend using it is using it use it when you want to do anything extended, an extended skirmish, an extended siege. You want to stop them from chasing you, an extended fight. Um, you want to, you know, create protection while you're sieging from flanks. Any any extended form of fi of play essentially. If I was just going to reset here, I would not use my tower. I would shove the wave and just instantly reset, save my tower for another time. The beautiful thing about this tower as well is it actually allows you to side lane quite well because then you can actually put your tower quite aggressively and then just use it as protection and push your limits in the side lane, get your team a lot of pressure. So it's actually a really good passive here because now I feel protected from Lee Sin. I know he's going to be find it hard to dive me. They're going to find it hard to take any form of extended trade here. Then um, Aurelia comes because I know he's going to go for the siege and we play for this fight. Now... Oh my god, this is so big, man. Look at this. So I have two soldiers down. Look at this. And Aurelia comes, flashes in with Q. Notice how I don't instantly use my Q. Big, big. 
You use your W's, you leave your W's there. I have my W coming up in one second, but look what I do. I'll play it out first and then talk about it. I use my W. And then follow with Q. And he ends up surviving with Lula. Look at that, guys. If I had just used my Q straight away, maybe this guy instantly dashes out and then I can't follow with Q. I can't continue to get auto attacks off. But because I held my Q, I was patient. I played for my W. Look at this. I get more auto attacks off. Then I can reposition and chase them. You can't do that if you start the fight with Q. So you need to be very intelligent with your W usage. Soldier usage on Azir is literally make or break. It's, it's, it's the main difference, I would say, between um, being able to reliably do damage in teamfights and not doing damage, and also the difference between um, the good Azirs and the great Azirs. And again, look, I'm doing the same thing, putting my soldiers behind me, auto-attacking here, knowing that I can just E out quite easily. So this allows you to push your limits when sieging. It's another nice little, neat little trick here as well. Get my attack speed buff, and we end up slowly getting that tower, but anyway... Fast forwarding here, get the get the wave, and I go for a reset. Beautiful looking good. Now, so in terms of itemization here, given that I'm the only AP or the main source of AP on the team, I go for Sorks and I go for Oblivion Orb. This is going to allow me to do a ridiculous amount of damage at this point in the game. It's a very, very solid, standard build. And I wouldn't even finish Morello's this game because I don't have any healing. So I believe I don't... Oh, I believe they have Lulu and actually they had a, a Bork Aurelia. So I think healing is actually not too bad this game. I think I maybe I might actually finish it. So, fast forwarding. I know my AD carry is dead top lane. So I go back mid. Then I already talked to my jungler here. I'm, I'm typing, typing to my jungler. Rengar, at 20 minutes, let's do Baron. Now this is massive. I'm going to show you another example. As, as a Zir, when you're ahead, you should always look to sneak um, Baron at 20 minutes. So let's just fast forward the game. It goes into a bit of a lull state at the moment because AD carries are dead, etc. So I just keep pushing out. Now, again, this is the benefit of going mid. Then what you can actually do is you get a lot of pressure. You can exert pressure onto side lanes like this. So they overextend. I get my movement speed with that little shrine thing. And I'm able to just, you know, Azir sec people. It's quite nice. Bang. Push them into the wall. No escape. All right. Now, another thing actually I haven't spoken about at all in this in this game is once you're into the side lane, say I do end up going to the side lane, which you do eventually, Azir is very good at doing jungle camps. So whenever coming out of base, whenever coming, doing anything, always do Wolves, Gromp, and um, and your, these Krugs. Because that's what's going to allow you to stay up in CS in the mid game. And because you can do them so fast and so efficiently, um, it's very, very handy. So fast forwarding a little bit here. Again, I do the same thing where I just put my soldiers behind me. I know I'm quite safe here. I can just reliably put my W behind me, get that attack speed boost, get some more towers. Really, really good stuff here. So, fast forwarding and up a little bit. I try to take as many camps as possible, but there's no camps here to take. Finish and I end up working towards my Rabadons. I actually don't get Amarillo's this game, so I work towards my Rabadons. So, this is the best build, ideally, if you feel the only AP. And now, 19 minutes in the game. What do I say? Rengar, at 20, let's Baron instantly. I literally give my jungler so much warning to get this Baron. So what do I do in the meantime? I just get jungle camps. This is how you're going to stay up, stay very farmed in mid game. So I take Wolves. I take Gromp. I get Blue on spawn. I know Baron spawning at 20 minutes. I tell my AD carry um, to go mid. I, it's really good, important habit to tell your AD carry not to help you. Just tell them to stay mid. I get some vision down. Use a Scry's Bloom. Ideally, I would have a pinker and pink the pit. Best to make sure there was no wards. Then what do I do? At 20 minutes with my jungler, it doesn't even matter if they're a tank or not. A lot of the time, if they're a tank, then it's super easy. If they're not, you can alternate tank, uh, alternate tanking with your E and things like that. Look at this. Three soldiers, got my Nashes, I'm popping. My AD carry shows mid, so they suspect nothing. This is what you can do so many. I've done this ridiculous amount of games on Azir. It can literally win you games. So we end up going for this Baron. Ends up being a really nice play here. And before they even realize we're doing it, we end up getting the Baron. Beautiful. And look, at least in pinks it, but it's gone. So no players in solo queue expect that. But I've literally primed my jungler for, I said at 16 minutes, and then I said at 19 minutes. I told my jungler twice that I wanted to do this. And I made it really efficient to do that, because I got jungle camps, now I can get back on the map. I can start pushing the sideline, start popping, start taking their jungle camps, start pushing my limits. Now, let's fast forward a little bit here, and I believe we just enter up a siege. Nothing too special here. And I think, I believe we end up just winning the game. Now, actually, one little topic I want to talk about here quickly. Okay. Now, 
Uh, and we'll get into more of this in some other vi videos, but what I want to talk about here is actually Zeus hacking in general. So when you're in these very 5v5 scrappy fights, or any team fight, you know how there's the uh, the term Lee Syndrome, where Lee Sin just has this like problem where they always want to go for some crazy as uh, like a, a Lee Sin kick. Zia problem, uh, Zia players have the same thing where you a lot of them will go. I went through the same thing where you go through a phase where you feel like you have to do some crazy all in play to like alt them all into your team and then go go go. Now you don't view AD, view Azir as more of like an 80 carry as you head into mid to late game. Azir doesn't need to do that, especially when you're ahead. You do a ridiculous amount of damage as a straight front to back champion. And the threat of you just being like this, right? Look at this threat. I have my soldiers out. I have my, I'm, I'm positioning super far ahead. I don't need to just EQ and ult them all into my team. Yes, maybe that may work. That may work. But a lot of the time, you're just going to be better off just playing the front to back fight, playing very standard. You don't need to do anything special as a Zia. So get it out of your system, play a, a bunch of games where you do some crazy ults, but you'll find that majority of the time, you don't need to do that unless it's a very obvious ultimate. Something to think about as well, why I actually a lot of the time like going Zonya's third sometimes is not just for self-peel, but for those alt plays. It allows you to do a lot more alt plays. So if you feel like you're the only engage for your team, and you really need a lot of engage, then actually get Zonya's third, in, or second, sorry, instead of um, Oblivion Orb or Rabadons, and actually go straight for Zonya's, and then you you can become the engage for your team. So it is just something to think about. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to go for a few quick other examples. So to tie up some of these concepts, so you really understand um, how to play Azir to that high level. So this is one of my early games playing Azir where I really was not good at Azir and I was really limit testing. I didn't understand all the small micro details with the champion. Now what I'm going to call this, this is the cardinal sin. This is the sin, this is the sin of all sins. Ready? So you're entering a skirmish like this. I see them on Rift Herald. What do I do? Now, what, given that you've just watched this video, my video so far, you should know that the best way to approach these fights is walk up first, put your W down, and then reposition with Q. It's going to give you more self-peel options, going to give you more engage options, going to give you more damage options. But this is when I was starting early on. This is what you, you, a lot of you guys will do when you first start playing Azir. It's like, oh, I see person, I use Q. So I do this, bang, Q. Look how bad that is. He just walks out. I have no way to be able to reposition my soldiers. I'm a bot. I'm, a, I'm an auto attack bot now. Nothing I can do. They can walk out of my soldiers. I'm useless. Okay, I can't Azir sec. I can't kill them. <laughs> I can't do anything. So what you need to do in these fights, you need to walk up, W, then reposition with Q. Now, this is actually another great example of the double soldier thing. If you do just want to play the range poke and you just want to Q poke because you, maybe you don't want to get in range or whatever, then do it with one soldier because, again, if you do two soldiers like I do here, notice how the soldiers actually spread out. Look at that. Notice how they spread out like that? They do this weird spreading motion, which actually means that they don't um, go as far. So it actually will really mess up your cues as well. So that's just something to think about. So this is the cardinal sin of Azir. Do not do this in your games. Now I'm going to show you one or two examples of some int plays that I did on Azir that basically ruined... This is what ruined my win rate all the time. So I had a good laning phase. I was slowly trying to figure out how to play lane. I was figuring out all the small micro details. These are the sorts of plays I did and what you're, I actually recommend for you to do to actually learn the limits of Azir. So, you know... This is actually how you're going to improve. So this is an example. I'm actually versing a Cassidy in here. And I've got him really, really chunked. He has no mana, very little HP. I'm basically full mana, full HP. I know it's an isolated 1v1. I get a really nice poke there. Then I see Cassidy in a second use his, his Q and E on the wave. I'm like, oh my god. He just uses Q, E on the wave in front of me? I have everything. So what do I do here? I wait for him, his magic shield to run out. I walk up. <laughs> I walk up my 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 uh my EQ. I actually believe this is really bad as well because look at my W. My W placement's really crappy. I should have walked up W'd a little bit further, then EQ'd. I would have actually hit him with my with my Q, which would have reset my soldiers, but this didn't reset my soldiers. But I thought it didn't even matter. So I could because I could just like flash ult him or whatever. But he used W to get the mana. I didn't realize that he had W still for mana, and he gets his mana back and then is able to ult me. If he didn't have mana, he didn't get the mana from W, he wouldn't have he would have just died here. There was nothing he could have done because he actually didn't have flash. So um I died because of this, and we end up losing this game because of this play. Because I just gave for, I just gave a massive uh, kill to Cassidy, and he just snowballs out of control, and that's really, really bad. Now, again, I don't care about this mistake because I came in with a hypothesis. I thought he had not enough mana for ult. 
I thought he didn't have W or forgot about W. This was my mistake. Now, if you play like a bitch and you don't push your limits like this, and you know don't have these painful experiences, you're not going to become a great player, in my opinion. This is how. I mean, this is how I do it. This is how I get to like. This is how I just learn champions. And I don't want you to feel ashamed for making mistakes. People out there get you, you get flamed for making one mistake. It's like, dude. Are you just going to play the same... That's why you're just a one-trick. You play two champions for like four seasons in a row, dude. Like, no, this is the type of mistake you have to make, guys. This is another example, guys, where I failed jungle tracking. So um, I want to push my limits in jungle tracking. So I'm versing a Silas. I get some really, really solid trades off in the early game. I'm playing really, really well. I actually uh, burn all his, his corrupting pods very early. And I ward topside at 230, do all the right things, knowing that I'm versing a Lee Sin. I was expecting him to do either red, Krugs, blue... Or, you know, red, blue, gromp into ganks or whatever. I didn't and so what I thought was that there's no way he would gank me from bot side, because Lee Sin um very, very rarely does Raptors, right? He usually does two camps, knowing that Volibear started bot, there's no way he's doing a vertical clear, and we have a ward there as well. There's no way out he would do three camp. Although it's very unlikely because he's not a, a AOE, he doesn't really do much AOE, he struggles to clear he doesn't really clear Raptors that fast, so he doesn't really do it too often because he doesn't go talisman. But what happens here, I've got this really nice built wave into the Silas. I've got Ignite. I'm in a super good position. The Silas has no corrupting pots. And then in a second, um, <laughs> Silas goes on me and Lee Sin does... I didn't know. Lee Sin did a three camp bot side. And what are the chances of this? This was a high elo game. So, I mean, this just happens. And this is like this was an ex-pro player jungler. This doesn't happen often. So, again, I'm not... And this ruined my game, obviously, because I burnt Flash. I died. Gives first blood. Whatever. Now I'm really, really far behind because Azir is very, it's very hard to come back when you're behind. Now, but more importantly, I don't care about this mistake. I came in with a hypothesis, my, according to my jungle tracking, that Lee Sin wouldn't gang me from bot side. I very rarely see Lee Sin do three camp bot side. I'm okay with this, okay? I, I, I lose the game off of it. It is what it is, okay? So you, again, as long as you are dying with intention, you're trying to test something or learn something, that's the way to get better, okay? Don't feel bad for dying, pushing your limits. Because, again, if I play defensive all the time and I'm just scared for no reason, then I'm probably going to lose lane and lose the game, give pressure to Silas. He's going to roam and the game's fucked anyway. So you have to do this sort of thing to learn on Azir. Now, lastly, I want to round up this video by showing you two quick examples. One is going to be Azir versus Zerith, just for the laning phase, and Azir versus Fizz. So you have a pretty good idea about versing differing types of mid laners. Now, I want to skip over it quite quickly just to kind of show you the premise. But again, what do we know about Zerith? We know that Zerith falls into that first category where he's a, you want to be hard pushing to relieve pressure from you because he has very long cooldowns. So I want to po push, 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 push. It's going to force him under tower. He's going to miss CS. He's going to not be able to poke me. It's going to make his life a living hell. So look what I do. I stand outside the wave so he can't actually poke me. I'm just playing for the wave completely. Push, 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 push. Then you'll see in a second, and as he is tries, trying to poke me, again, okay, cool. You, I just dodge that. He doesn't. Able, he's not able to wave clear, and I'm starting to hardcore push here. Now you'll find as, it, as this lane actually continues to um, to go on then it's going to be um, very difficult for Azir to get any meaningful poke. So I'm starting to get my level 2 in a second. So I'm hard pushing the second wave, trying to get the first creep. Again, standing outside the minion wave. Beautiful. I get level 2 in a second. Draw for a level, bit, nice little level 2 poke there. Use my Halo Blaze to, pro to um, shove the wave again. And again, I'm just making this Azir, this Zerith's life really, really difficult to get any meaningful poke. So I use this time to get some vision, come back, do the exact same thing. Rinse, repeat. Because no champion like this who has long cooldowns can out wave clear an Azir is, is if I play for the wave like this. There's nothing he can do. He can't, he can't, he can't kill me because then he loses too much farm and then I can just reset anyway. Because even if he does, let's say I'm not good at dodging and I take maybe two or three maybe two or three Qs to the face, and maybe two or three Ws. He's going to be Oom. That means I'm going to be able to have, have this little wave hard shoved in. Then I can just actually, while he's reacting to this wave, I can just go out. He's going to be Oom. I can go out, reset. He's not going to be able to hard shove the next wave anyway because he's going to be Oom regardless. So either way, it's checkmate. He's not poking me, in which I get through the laning phase, outscale, get to level 6, and set up a kill on him. Or, and just roam. Or, he uses poke on me, he doesn't touch the wave, he misses CS, goes oom, and then I can just get a free reset regardless. So that's what happens. I'm just playing for the wave like this continually, pushing him, pushing him in. 
I'm, I can, I've safely got pressure, so I can actually get to any river skirmish first. Uh, I'm forcing this guy to miss CS, use, use abilities on the wave, and then you basically survive the whole early laning phase. Then at level 6, I have ridiculous amount of kill threat on this guy with my, with my Zirsek. Then it's GG. So, um, again, the same thing. Jungle tracking, warding, having intention with your wave, understanding what his ears strengths are, his wave clear, and just continuing that whole process, guys. So this is, again, the, the really solid way of playing out um, this matchup. But my only advice for this matchup, guys, if you're going to play it, is um, you have to be conscious which wave is the, which, which is the wave you're actually basing on. Because in this situation like this, you may actually overstay thinking that you have enough mana to hard shove the next wave. And if you, do, if you do that, then the next wave comes, you don't have enough mana, then you're going to be completely screwed. So I, you have to be very conscious about knowing exactly which wave you're going to base on. Otherwise, you're going to you know, get yourself, get yourself um, into a sticky situation. So let's actually go on to the Fizz VOD. So with this last one here, guys, this one's going to be Azir versus Fizz, and it's the exact same thing. Now, okay, there's two options. There's the slow push, where you literally just auto-attack one minion, one or two minions, and then build a slow push from level one into po hard poke under tower. Or there's the hard push level one, hard push level two, or sometimes, you know, you don't even hard push level two, and then you begin to slow build a wave, then reset. So, again, it depends on the jungler. So, I'm actually versing a Lee Sin jungle. The problem with slow building away from level one, I just don't like it because... A lot of the time, it's really awkward because I slow build away from level one. This huge wave builds at around you know two minutes thirty, where it's gonna. I don't really find a good time to ward, and then even if Lee Sin shows into river, I'm not gonna be able to re reliably poke this guy into tower, even if I know he's there. So a lot of the time, I find it wasted. So what I actually like to do is hard shove level one, like by getting killing those range creeps, like I do before. Fizz actually gets first blood here, but it doesn't really matter. So he's not here in lane, but the same thing would have happened. So I hard shove, hard shove, hard shove. Get a little bit of poke here onto this Fizz. Again, doing the same thing where I'm playing for level 2. So I start auto-attacking the, the melee creeps as, as fast as I can. Get some more poke off. But more importantly, trying to get poke onto these minions. Like this. Get my level 2. Ideally, I'm going to try and go for a bit of poke if he walks up. Like that. I actually miss my auto-attacks. But you'll see, again, I hard shove the first two waves. And after hard shoving these first two waves, I'll duck out of vision, get a ward around 220. This is going to give me a bit, of, get a bit of room, bit of bit of breathing space. And then, this is where I don't hard shove anymore. I kind of let it come out a little bit. And you'll see, as this comes out, I just play for poke. This is going to make it really hard for Fizz to do anything. So if we fast forward a little bit here, the waves will start to build a little bit. I build a bit of a slow push going on here. Um, and then as a slow push, actually, you know, I've got pressure, obviously, heading around 315, which is, again, what I recommend. This is why building a slow push, fast pushing the first two waves and slow building the third one like this can be really effective because you can have pressure around 315. Beautiful. Again, I'm slow pushing, leaning towards my jungler. And um, building this wave in. Beautiful. And then, because you've got a slow push into these assassins, you're able to get a really nice recall, knowing the next wave is going to be a cannon. Like that, around uh, four minutes, you get a nice base with a Dorans and a Dagger and a Pink Ward. You come back, because this guy had to deal with the built wave and it's a cannon wave, you come back and then you can just freeze the wave like this. So this is a really reliable and a really um, replicable way of versing any assassin, as long as you are jungle tracking, you're warding, you're paying attention to your jungler's pathing, um, and you're very conscious and, in, and having intention with your early wave. So this is a really, really solid way of um, both punishing the early laning phase of these of these laners. You get to deny them, you get to poke them a lot, force them to use all their pots, you get a lot of pressure, you secure the rift scuttles, and you get a free reset with a, for your second Dorans and a dagger, and you also get um, a freeze on the back end here, which again, if he overstays, he has no mana, he's completely fucked, and if he bases, he's screwed either way because he loses so much. So, now... Um, lastly, the last thing I want to end this video on is talk about one last thing. You need to use a click. So, attack move. Attack move is absolutely essential on a Zia. If you don't use a click on a Zia, you're going to find it really hard to reliably do damage in fights. So, I, I recommend spending a lot of time in practice tool using a click. Um, and getting really comfortable with it. Because if you don't use a click, it's, you're just going to be all over the place. So, 
Hope that this video was really, really helpful for you. I know it's quite in detail. I know there was quite a few things that I actually covered. Um, if you have any questions about anything, whether it's the matchup stuff, the theory stuff, or the gameplay oriented stuff, feel free to leave a comment below or message me in the Discord. Cheers. Thanks for watching.